This webinar series is called Next Steps. It's provided by GPN Technologies, a provider of the Edge uh, Pro dashboard for practice analytics. And it's uh, our weekly effort, sometimes we have more than one session in a week like this week, to give a practical roadmap for us to get back to business. And this is the second of a number of sessions that will happen in the coming weeks. This one is called Ready, Set, Open. And we're going to hope to provide some scheduling plan advice for ECP business owners. Um, pleased to have uh, Dr. Lori Lippiat along with us. But before that, I'm Scott Jens. I'm a doctor of optometry. I have about 25 years clinical experience and was a state and national optometry volunteer and then founded and was CEO of a software company in the eye care space from which I retired in 2018. And I now am a senior executive coach to the GPN Technologies team, but also am uh, running an executive business coaching service called Sandbox. Dr. Lippiad is from Ohio and she's our uh, second in a row expert. Uh, glad to have her from the Salem Eye Care Center, which she founded in 1989. Is one of the most progressive ECP business leaders and clinicians I've ever met. I'm very happy to have her here. She's got a great leadership history, having consulted for OfficeMate and Ifinity and Vision Web and Marco, and is on the executive board of the Optical Women's Association. Thank you for sharing your time again with us today, Dr. Lippiad. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be back. Now, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of doctors who are started thinking, sort of thinking about a, a return to, to practice and have genuine interest in topics like PPE and sanitation and patient screening and telemedicine, the list goes on. Our first webinar, which was held last week, uh, covered these topics, so please don't expect us to have to retread them today. Um, we're going to be able to allow you to access those on GPN's I Thrive website, which is ithrive.net, E-Y-E, thrive.net. And we hope that you will avail yourself to those, uh, where Dr. Lippiat spoke about a, a bunch of those topics uh, last Thursday. Uh, today's session is about scheduling considerations, and you know, really things are very different for us now. Uh, when you think about returning your practice to clinical care, even if it's in a reduced capacity, you're needed to handle all kinds of new guidelines for scheduling and staffing. And so our objectives today include one, to examine the scheduling options you might have and think about a template that might match your business needs. Two, to define the types of staffing requirements you'll need for a new schedule. And three, to assess the types of metrics and new KPIs that will help you be sure you're on track. Um, you know, Lori, we're in this new place, and I'd like to have you help us think about the way that there are new objectives that you have sort of taken from your historical way you ran your practice. If you'd be willing to do that, I think it would be great to talk about where you were and where you're headed. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, it'd be great to sort of give some context uh, for everyone as to the type of practice that we started with, where we're at now, and, and where we're looking to go in the future. So we're a 2OD practice. Uh, the practice operates uh, two and a half days a week with both doctors. So we have two and a half days a week of double doctor time. We scheduled in the past every 15 minutes plus some progress checks thrown in between so we could easily see 25 to 30 patients a day and on do double doctor days uh, have, you know, up past 70 people flowing through the practice. So we um, have a full-time pediatric uh, optometrist that I practice with that manages mostly the pediatric care, but we practice comprehensive care, everything from glaucoma to um, cataract post-ops to myopia management and whatnot. Started off 20, uh, the year of vision, 2020, uh, great, and then everything changed a lot. So as things changed, uh, March 18th actually was the last day, and I mentioned this last week, the last day that we practiced our regular schedule. And we have been practiced, we've been open this whole time, practicing emergency care, um, and here we are. So where are we? We've decreased our staff from nine to six. I did need to furlough three people. Our hours of operation decreased by about 66% to about three hours a day. We're currently open from nine until noon, five days a week. And as I mentioned, uh, reduced 
uh, step. So this has been a big change for us. And um, even though it's been a big change, we're working to get to where we can return to full-time patient care. And that's what I'd like to spend some time talking about with you guys today. Uh, as we talked about last webinar, there was a lot of attention paid this last four weeks to the physical plant. And now we're ready to talk about our approach to the patient schedule. Lori, before you go forward and we think about going to the new schedule, a 66% reduction for emergency care, you know, some doctors are just taking the calls as they come and handling them themselves. And I guess I'd be curious what your load of patients has been like. Just, you know, a couple of examples. Great question. Some days none, some days five, some days four. Uh, the biggest learning that I've had over this period of time isn't how many emergency patients I have as much as it has been preparing the office, educating staff, walking through protocols, developing protocols for re-entry into this new world that we're in. So I have felt that it has been invaluable to be here at the practice this whole time, working with staff together to become uh, the, the new normal practice that we are. And, so. and you really set a goal to keep patients from having to access I, urgent eye care services in the ER, less about, oh, I, you know, I need revenue, I need to bill something. And I think that's a very important point. There are a lot of optometrists that have done an incredible service to their community at times, or even full scope ophthalmology practices are closed. Is can you speak about what's been open around you? Because I think you've told me you're, you're one of the few, if not the only, open in a large geographic area. Right. So we, are, we went into shelter in place and then had an extension for four more weeks, which um, hopefully will be lifted May 1st here in Ohio. Um, what I first received was a letter from the state board asking for those of us that could to, to remain open to help people stay out of the emergency room. I'm an active uh, member of the community. I know a lot of the physicians around town and they were asking me the same thing. I can tell you there's been some weeks that we've kept 10 or 12 people out of the emergency rooms, some weeks plus, some weeks more, but every patient that we've kept out of the emergency room has been so grateful to us and we plan on continuing that. Okay, well then we're about ready to set into our first of our three areas of discussion. Is that right? To talk about scheduling options and scheduling template ideas? Correct. So, you know, as I mentioned, we, after preparing the physical office, uh, that took a long time to develop the protocols, uh, think about patient re-engagement. And the one thing that I can tell you, it takes more time than you think it will take. Um, and one thing I want to mention is that it has been fantastic to bring you this information in real time. So I am living it, um, Scott ha and, the, and the team has been living it with me. Every day we're learning new things about our patients, our staffs, uh, the community. So literally this series is happening as it's happening. It is in real time. So the first weeks uh, with the scheduler to return to, to our topic, we needed to move the existing patients that were on the schedule. Obviously, we book ahead, so we had patients scheduled in March and April. We didn't know what we were going to do with the May patients, but we ended up moving most of those two um, to, to further down uh, in the fall. Essentially, what I wanted to focus on was what is the schedule going to look like when we're ready to reopen. So no matter what your intended return to work uh, date is, it's important to decide how you're going to move patients that are currently on the schedule and then how you're going to deal with the patients that are coming up. So we decided to take a gamble and leave some May patients on the schedule simply because it's easier to move patients off the schedule than it is to get them back on. And we also needed to be mindful of all the learnings that we had from seeing our emergency patients, my staff's reactions to being in the office, the patient's reactions to being in the office. Um, but our, our goal this whole time has been to learn and work 
towards a re-engagement with our, with our patients. So some key elements that I'd really like you to consider that we had to consider is how many people do you really think that you can handle in your, in your office with the staff that you plan on having returning? Last week we talked about um, social distancing in the reception areas and there's a lot of creative ways that you can place patients in the practice. So you'll want to start thinking of how in terms of patient load at one time. We had double doctor days, so we have decided to uh, only have one doctor in the practice at a time so that we can manage our workflow with patients through the practice. And then the next thing um, is determining the amount of time that you're going to spend uh, with each patient encounter. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, as well as the type of exams you're going to uh, perform. As I said, we, we do all types of comprehensive care. We've also gone, uh, we've always done scheduling for eyewear pickup, but again, I've realized how important that is so that we can really manage traffic flow through the practice. And then if you do have a reduced staff returning, you're going to need to figure out how you manage uh, the lunch time areas. I want to talk just for a moment, Lori, about you saying that it takes longer. This is as part of your observation. And as you think about the elements to consider, and you're going to show some uh, templates of examples of schedules. Can you be specific about what you're saying there, that, that there is a real difference in how to see patients if you're going to stay committed to proper facility maintenance, proper facility cleaning? I'd like you to expand on that before we go further. Right. So one of the things that we implemented uh, were very specific protocols for disinfection. And Scott, I think later we're going to um, actually walk through an animation of how I train my staff. So what I've learned is that um, it's going to take a long, longer time with training staff and getting them comfortable than you originally thought. What I did um, was decide to go to a 30-minute spacing with my patients to start. My hope is that over the summer months we can ramp up a little bit more, but this is what I feel comfortable with at this point. So whether you have one doctor, two doctors, three doctors, four doctors in your practice, um, you can modify these templates and we're going to be sending you this whole slide deck. But this is going to be the example of how we manage our scheduler in our practice. So in our physical scheduler, we marked off in this example for Dr. A, times for me to see patients on the half hour. The 15 minute marks are actually blacked out or blocked off so that patients can't use our online scheduling tool to schedule on times when I don't have, the, have available. We've also taken to scheduling uh, pickups or people that need repairs or adjustments in the optical the same way so that we can manage our traffic flow based on our physical space. And there's a lot of ways to slice and dice this. There's no right or wrong way, but it's time to start thinking about a way to manage it. Another option that some people are doing are having two doctors in the office at the same time. One doctor seeing a patient at the top of the hour the second doctor seeing the patient at the bottom of the hour. Again, lots of ways to slice and dice it. I guess the real important note is that you need to start preparing your schedule now to accept these types of modifications, especially um, as you go forward to reopening. Hasn't your issue with the two-doctor practice or multi-doctor practice been to consider the full human load that you can put inside the facility and that if, if two doctors are working very proximal to one another to be very mindful and thoughtful before planning for both doctors to be there about how many people you can really have there, two doctors are just, you know, two more people that you have to add to the patient load? 
Right. And even just having the other doctor there is another person. As I worked with my associate doctor, one of the things that was important to both of us was safety. Number one, above everything else and getting comfortable with this new normal. So we thought initially it would be best to see patients one doctor at a time and that's what we've decided to do. Again, the other option though is to split the day and I think this is a great option especially if you're extending your hours. So as you modify your schedule and you saw that on a normal day there were 14 slots, in order to have access to more patient availability, you may choose to split the day, meaning split the day with the doctor and split the day with the staff, which will, um, again, give you more opportunities in a day to see more patients, especially in the beginning. Lori, uh, a doctor, Richter, asked a question about use of scribes. Do you use them? And then speak generally about what you think about practices that do use scribes as we go forward into this sort of early reopen phase? I don't use the scribe. Um, we've used electronic medical records for, gosh, at least uh, 18 years. Um, I don't use a scribe. I know a lot of people do use a scribe. I don't see a problem with that as long as there's social distancing. And by that, I mean, if a patient is entering an examination room with a caregiver, you're just going to be needing to be mindful that now you have the patient, the doctor, a caregiver, and a scribe, and that's four people in a room. So again, these are things, no right or wrong, you just need to think through them based on your size, capacity, and the comfort of your staff. Okay. All right, so as you've seen these emergency patients and you've given some hypotheticals around scheduling, we've got this idea to think about process time. You said it takes you know, 30 minutes to think about disinfection protocols and all the things that are necessary to, to build the schedule so you don't get patients in a, on top of each other. Let's talk about the variables as you see them and um, you know, some of the things you found that might be useful for the attendees to today's session uh, as key variables. Right, so we're testing every day. One of the things, and I think I talked about this last week, is we, we break down at the end of the day together to talk about things that worked and things that didn't work. And that's how we've kind of got to where we are today. Um, so interestingly, yesterday was Monday. So I um, had the most patients back to back that I've had during this time. And I don't know what the reason uh, was or if there's just more people that have decided to close their doors. But in any case, I saw eight patients spaced 30 minutes apart for emergency care yesterday, which was the most that I've ever seen during this period of time in a row. And I feel very comfortable with our 30 minute interval spacing and disinfection protocol, which we'll talk about again in a minute. Um, but some of, some of your decision is also going to depend on the PPE that you decide you're having staff wear. We are wearing full, um, we're wearing gloves, masks, uh, and face shields uh, when we're, we're delivering patient care. We're having the patients wear masks and we're providing masks for patients if they don't come with one. Um, and and some, some practices may have sourcing issues for PPE. So again, start thinking and preparing to have PPE. It's becoming more difficult to get. So before you make uh, a decision about how many patients you're going to see, you need to make sure you have the appropriate PPE um, e as well. And then also um, staff, uh, again, uh, learn, learned a lot through this process. Helping staff become comfortable in this COVID world is very important. And we talked about leadership last week, and it becomes very important uh, as you start to think about reentering uh, patient care. So, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Interject. Um, when you think about the the doctor needs, the staff needs PPE. When you when you know most ECPs have the optical retail side of the business. 
Uh, should that be scheduled as well? Are you going to allow people to just walk in or do you get firm and, and concrete about what you'll do in that part of the business? Absolutely, we've locked it down. Um, we have a schedule for the optical. So um, patient selections, any adjustments, any repairs, any pickups are all scheduled. Actually, we're not allowing any patients to be seen without an appointment, truthfully. Okay. okay. All right, sorry. That was yeah, so when, when I was teaching my staff disinfection uh, protocols, um, interestingly, uh, they, it, it, workflow isn't something, I mean, my staff understand patient workflows, disinfection workflows wasn't anything, you know, we, we obviously disinfected things, but we didn't have strict protocols. So um, what I did was literally draw it out on a piece of paper and walk through it using a pen and kind of uh, designing the protocol to help them understand. So what we've done for you is we've made an animation that really speaks to that. So Scott, if you could pull that up, I think it's the next yeah, slide. It is. I, sometimes I get caught looking at uh, questions, my bad. Okay, so this is an easy way for you to teach your staff how to do a disinfection routine. In any case, you can do it on a piece of paper. This is actually the paper that I drew mine on. It was just a sheet of paper, draw your office. Um, in this example, a patient walks in through the front door, checks in at the front desk, and sits down. So we know this area is going to need disinfected. The pretest staff would then come and get the patient, take them to pretest room. So now we have another room that's going to need disinfected. At this point, our front desk person goes out and disinfects the reception area, the front door, sits back down. The patient is then taken to the exam room. The pretester would finish uh, the pretesting and then go back to the pretest room. I, the doctor, would come in, do my examination, and then the patient would be escorted to optical for frame selection. Meanwhile, the pretest staff would go and, and disinfect the exam room. The optician would then be responsible for the optical. The patient has used the restroom and exited through the front door. So the optical personnel would then disinfect the optical. The person out front has gone to the restroom and then back out through the front door to disinfect the railing and the, um, the doorknobs. So um, again, I just found it really effective with my staff to draw this out, draw out the routine, and that has worked really well for us. And I think the point here is develop a set of rules, inform and declare those rules, and then make sure there's carry through on those rules by the people that are working with you and for you in the practice and on the betterment of the patient. I mean, it sounds obvious, but in many cases, practices often, you know, there's, there, are, um, there are hierarchies, right? There are people who are willing to do certain things. But in this case, you ask everyone to come along. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you take part in any of these things? How are you a participant in this? Seems like everyone else has got something to do. I'm sure you're doing some things to your equipment as well. I actually am relying on my pretest staff to disinfect all of the exam equipment. I am um, being a leader in the practice and doing my job by delegating and overseeing uh, best practices at this point. Okay. All right. Well, that's a great visual, and I, I think I get it, right? We got to have some rules, and we got to have action on those rules. Let's talk about the other areas um, that are considerations when it comes to schedule uh, before we talk about staffing matters. That is uh, recall and reminders. You've spoken a little bit about how you took everyone off the books, and then you've started to make some adjustments. Um, talk about these areas. Yeah, um, we do use an automated service, so we decided to turn off the recall for March, April, and May. 
We're still using the reminder since we're managing the schedule internally. I think that's a decision that you need to make with your staff, whatever works best for you. Um, the point here is that we need to think well in advance because in our case, our patients are pre-appointed and our patient confirmations start about three weeks ahead. So had we not been proactive with our schedule, our patients would have been getting confirmations for appointments that we were going to have to change. So the, the big takeaway from this slide is you need to be managing your schedule internally, but also far ahead out um, so that if you're using an automated service, you're staying uh, caught up with that. So there are a lot of doctors who have taken care of their April and May who are getting ready to reopen and are preparing for the idea of placing patients. And it looked to me like your templates are going to be about 50% loaded. <laughs> I mean, that might even be a stretch to say it's 50% of what your normal capacity was. So they're going to start to stagger appointments going forward. And then they're going to put into their technology, the new system and a pop, you know, populate appointments. And then at some point in the future, maybe in May, when they know they're ready, they're going to start sending out notices to those patients who do have appointments. Um, can you give us any guidance on how to contact your patients in general who maybe are being pushed off many months and how you deal with that, those? All of the patients that were on the schedule for March and April, but have, and now we're, you know, halfway through April, all of those patients were contacted manually, to be honest. Um, we found that since ever, it was shelter and home, we've never had such a high percentage of success in reaching patients. Um, our patients appreciated it. No one knew what was going to happen back then. So we didn't know whether it was going to be 14 days or, or the six weeks that it's turned into. So everyone understood our older patients really wanted to be pushed off until the summer. We did keep a list of patients that said to us, we want to be first in when you guys open up. Those were mostly contact lens patients, uh, patients that just like to get new glasses, those type of patients. So we knew who was eager to come in, but we, man we manhandled March and April. Yeah, and I want to decipher that for the folks who didn't attend last week's webinar. Please go back and check it out. We think it's got valued content. Manhandle by Lori's words means we physically got call lists together and even from home started calling patients. And I think that that can you know, be seconded today as a really valuable way to take care of people. I want to, before we go on to staffing considerations, these are related to the, the situations you showed through the office work around, uh, walk around. Um, you know, when, when you've got a patient that's being walked through a new schedule into optical, you know, we talked about scheduling patients in the optical. Uh, how in the world do you keep somebody out of uh, out of the clinic who wants to walk into optical and pick up their glasses? I, I know a sign up front's right, but how, how do you police that? With kind How do you envision policing it, I should say? Uh, well, we're scheduling all of our pickups. So when someone's eyewear will be ready to be delivered, we will contact them. We'll also offer offer curbside service. So we're we're prepared to pre-adjust as much as possible at the time of selection so that hopefully it's not a lot of adjusting uh, when the eyewear is in. Um, but we've always scheduled our optical, so this isn't a foreign concept uh, to us or our patients, and it actually works really well for managing patient flow. It's going to take some getting used to if you decide to go that route, but Now's the time to make changes that patients are going to accept and adopt as normal, the new normal. So things that you may have been thinking about managing a little different in your practice, I found now is the time to really go ahead with those changes because everything's changing. So patients just aren't surprised. So as an off-the-cuff hypothetical, a patient could walk into the front door, maybe not pay attention to the sign, and as opposed to shaming them for being there to pick up glasses that maybe they ordered in February and didn't call and didn't avail themselves to the curbside, and you have perhaps trained a front desk reception person to say, we now schedule everything, Mrs. Smith, 
I'm really sorry because of us trying to keep distancing that we can't see you right now, but could you come back at you know 12, 15 this afternoon or 8.30 tomorrow morning because we now need to schedule those and you're finding patients are understanding of that? No, we wouldn't do that. Um, okay. in, in that particular case, that would not happen. We would explain to the patient that going forward, we do like to work from appointments, but we have enough space here that we could social distance them until there was a few minutes that those okay. glasses could be delivered. We are being so accommodating to patients and our patients are being accommodating to us. So okay. we always put patients first to try to take care of what they need. So this would be true if an outside RX walked in or whatnot, you would not mm -hmm. physically reschedule them. Okay, that's great to know. Um, we're gonna shift to staffing topics now, Lori. And one of the things that uh, you know came up earlier as you were showing the icons moving around by a question was, you know, staff like to get together and, and talk. Everyone's got a job here. You're gonna talk about staffing, but along the way, please also give the attendees some insights about the distance you're asking everyone to take inside the practice. Staffing is our next topic. It's a really important one, and obviously your historical staffing is a point of reference. So why don't we start with that? Right, so with the new way of doing things, to your point, Scott, some of us are going to have a 50% reduction in patient load. And, you know, we started with 100% staffing for 100% schedule. So everyone's going to have to take a look at their capacity and then take a look at the people that they need to do their schedule. By that, I mean support staff. So if you take a, a look at a traditional office, there's someone usually to greet the patient unless you have self-check-in. You have some type of technician that's managing the equipment. Um, you have someone that's managing the, the frame area. Then you usually have back-end support. Sometimes your back-end support is uh, from remote sources. That's fine. The point of the slide is for everyone to start thinking about the physical management of patients through your practice. How many staff people is it now going to take to work the new schedule with reduced patient load. Um, so it's, it's sort of thinking a little differently, the minimum number of, of people. So even though you have a reduced patient load, perhaps, uh, there are new workflows. So sometimes that takes a little longer. Everybody's practice is going to be different. In our case, we did furlough some staff. So one thing that I think everyone has been speaking about is when do you bring them back? And the approach that we are taking at Salem Eye Care is we are bringing furloughed staff, patient, uh, furloughed staff back when we have the patient load to need them back. That's our approach. Everybody's approach could be different. We have um, really done deep diving into cross uh, training over the years. So we put together a little, little tool for you that I use that helped me quickly identify who would be coming back and, and maybe who would remain furloughed for some more time. Um, if you're expanding hours, I give you the example of, a, of staggered work schedules. That could be something to take a look at. Again, be prepared to modify and adjust. Nothing these past four and a half, almost five weeks have gone exactly as I would have guessed or planned for. We've had to juggle and kind of weave some things to, to change it. Um, but again, please be mindful of staff. This is new to them as well. And um, they're doing things differently. Maybe it's not more work or less work, but it, it could be different work. And um, it's not an easy time for them as well. So this next slide, I think, uh, gives you the little grid that I use just to work through. So in this example, Tiffany is a person that I most likely would want uh, back in order to manage, help me manage my new schedule versus, uh, let's just pick one, uh, Kathy. Kathy in this example has one skill, she's a tech, um, she can't help at front desk, she can't do optical, and she can't do anything in the back office. So as I kind of took a look at my new schedule and looked at staff, I used this little grid to, to help me work through the best people to help me get through the next period of time. 
So from here, we're going to talk about you know, what we think are the keys to various rooms and procedures in the clinic. We've had some questions come up already related to the scheduling, and you're going to talk now about some special services around does every 30 minute block as an example, is it open for anything? Is it open for a comprehensive exam, as much of a contact checkup or a medical progress evaluation? As we shift to some of these specials and talking about the topics like dilation and special testing rooms, could you speak to that before we jump to those slides? In the schedule you have now, do you yeah, envision every yeah. slot being made equally? So that is a great question and we had to talk about it as a team. We have made every slot equal in value for any type of patient encounter. And the reason that we're doing that is because we have been delivering patient care for four and a half weeks now. And I understand with the new protocols that we have put in place here, the additional time requirements. So in the old days, I could whip a contact lens progress check in and out of here and if everything was okay in five, 10 minutes total. Um, we're not limited by the type of exam right now. Um, we're limited by the type of exam plus the disinfection protocol. So it's changed things. Now, my hope is that we get better at it. But since we've only been delivering emergency care and not doing full comprehensive care the way we used to, we need a little time. So we're going to take a little time and do it the right way. Yeah, I always thought of scheduling as all about the resources necessary to process the patient. And certainly resources are much less in demand for somebody who needs a visual field and move on uh, or a contact lens check. But now the resource of cleaning and making sure that both staff and patients are safe and properly taken care of um, sort of makes all visits equal and again reduces the opportunity for comprehensives but we're going to get the KPIs at the end of this session so everyone stay in, in for that one let's talk about some of these special considerations you have Lori in the physical plant so we just talked about the fact that um, there's comprehensive exams there's progress checks there's you know, all different types of e exams as optometrists that we do um, we have decided to make every slide uh, equal um, but what we're going to do is try to keep it at one patient, one room. By that, I mean um, we are only allowing one patient to be in a room, whether they're there for a comprehensive exam or they uh, are there for a progress check. If they're being dilated and need to go to optical, they're still coming back to the original room for completion of their care. That's just helping my staff. That may need to change, but that's our philosophy for right now. Okay. So, so how do we handle special testing? Well, we have all kinds of different special testing here. We have diopsis, we have, um, uh, but, uh, we're doing VEPs, we're doing OCTAs, we're doing um, visual fields. For right now, this interim period that uh, we're ramping up for, we have decided to suspend any prolonged testing like an extensive visual field for stable patients. So if we know a patient has been stable, stable for a while, we're just prolonging those visits into the fall until uh, we get things figured out. The other thing that we've really had to think through is contact lens insertion and removal. So um, what we're doing for now is we're starting to teach our staff how to train using a, a program on the iPad and we'll be monitoring patients from a little bit further distance. We used to sit side by side with the patient. So we are going to test that out. And again, the beauty of this series is that we're able to bring you um, information on what's working, what's, what, what's not working in real time. So we'll be sure to report back on that as well. 
So we've been asked some questions around these, you know, exam room and special testing protocols as, you know, if we deal with minors or we have seniors with caregivers, you spoke about that briefly earlier, let's bring that up to the surface. That brings another person into the equation, you know, distancing, providing them PPE. Um, how are you, man how are you envisioning managing that? Again, every practice is going to be different. So we have some exam rooms that are larger than others. Um, some of our exam rooms are very large. So we have walked through, I guess that's a, a wonderful question because the purpose of this is to get everyone to start thinking of those, those exceptions, right? So um, how many people can you safely uh, fit in a room? We have our tape measure that we walk around with and we position chairs in the exam rooms to uh, respect spatial distancing. So I think everybody needs to walk through the type of examination care that you're delivering and figure out the spacing now. I mean, now before it happens. Now, uh, somebody just asked, do you have any recommendation on INR uh, procedure software? Do you, can you mention a, a brand that you're using or do you know of brands that are available? We can follow up um, with iThrive and, and provide that information. Okay. Um, there have been some questions around the staffing side of this. We're about to go to KPIs, which is a very important part of this presentation. But, um, you know, you've got staff that may be on furlough. You don't know when they're going to come back. They might find another job, right, if you don't bring them back. So there, there's a risk. Uh, there's some questions about PPP and loan status, which I and you are not yet experts on. So I'm going to sidestep some of those with all apologies to attendees. And then there's just the reality of how healthy are these people and are you doing any testing you know, on employees? So before we leave staff, could you give us a little bit of a sense of, of those things? Right. We're following um, guidelines put out by our state to test employees for safety uh, at work. So, yes, we're testing. Temperature? Temperature. Um, every day we check in. So we talked last week about our daily huddle. Every day we have a check-in. So check-in. Are we healthy? Um, is any, everyone states their temperature. So um, we do that. We also have the capacity to measure temperatures in the, in the practice. We, my core team now, we're at week four and a half of this. So we're kind of veterans. But um, we are taking all of the safety precautions with staff that we can possibly take, as well as putting in, um, a U I think we talked about a UV filter in our um, ductwork and our air uh, filtration system. We've added air purifiers, education every day, um, a debrief every day after we're done seeing patients on how we could be better, what can we do, what are patients saying, keeping a pulse on how patients feel, how uh, safe patients feel. Patients are feeling safe here. Pa patients are feeling very safe in our office and we're getting that feedback from them. Good. So taking care of your staff allows you to take care of your patients. I get it. Uh, I want to make a note for the GPN team that we did get a question about Dr. Lipiat's UV filter system inside of her uh, air system that, that hadn't been posted from last week as a resource. If we could make sure to try to get that out to the attendees that uh, will be following the Next Steps series. Well, then let's go ahead and talk about KPIs. I mean, the thing is here, everybody, is that you're not alone. Everybody's practice has dropped precipitously. There just isn't somebody out there with the secret sauce that's found a way to um, keep their practice open. It would have been inappropriate for anybody to have kept their practice open with national attempts to get proper PPE levels to healthcare workers on the front lines, and our numbers show it. We're all in a tough position. So we want to take it from this bottom position upward. And, you know, Lori, you're prepared to talk about your own KPIs, which I know every OD has a hard time doing in front of a group. You know, there's very few people that say, show me yours, I'll show you mine. They, you know, we're all very protective. And in a time where we can help each other out, I'm grateful that GPN Technologies has, you know, brought up your data and that you're willing to share it with folks to start thinking about what are the new numbers so we can get our revenues balanced with our expenses. I, I doubt anybody's really worried about profitability, but instead paying for the key staff, the rent and overhead expenses so we can see patients and get back to whatever the new normal is. With that, I, I say to you, thank you again, and let's, let's talk about some of the numbers as you look at them. It's humbling. It's so, humbling. Um, yeah, um, this is our practice. So what I did, I, I'm a big believer in data over emotions. 
So uh, we all had our emotional reaction to what happened. Um, so I wanted to get our analytical view uh, of what happened. So we rely on analytics. It's how I really um, structure bonuses and other type of things that happen in this practice. So what I did was I took a look at last year. I told you that March 18th was my last day of regular patient care. So I took a look at March 19th through April 20th, which was yesterday. Our total revenue doing emergency care um, and, and added telemedicine, um, our total revenue is down 72.8%. Clinic is down 61.8%, and optical revenue is down 84.7% uh, this year over last year. So um, that's the bad side. So that's the revenue side. Um, obviously, on the expense side, to take a brighter look, um, we did cut some overhead. Uh, for us, cutting uh, overhead is, is staff and, and cost of goods. And I encourage everyone, and Scott will too, I'm sure at the end, to attend the webinar on Thursday where that um, Dr. Kling, I believe, is performing on digging out uh, of this financial hole. So that'll be real important. But from a year to date view, um, from a year to date view, even though it's that bad for this period of time, a year to date view, we are down 17% uh, total revenue, 16% clinic, and 19.5% optical. On the exam side. Um, Lori, before you go there, there were a lot of questions based upon some uh, abbreviations that I used, and they've been addressed by the staff. But I want to make sure everyone understands uh, that key performance indicators or KPIs are ways that some business people drive their vision to the business. As Lori said, not emotional, but data analytic based. And of course, GPN Technologies with its amazing Edge Pro dashboard can give you um, that kind of KPI data on a regular and, and very much granular basis. And that's how we're you know, basing this part of the conversation. So I'm sorry for using the acronym KPI, but I hope that all of you will start living in a KPI world as Dr. Lipiat's showing us today. And just to make sure I repeat what you say before we go to exam, if you take the year to date, despite the last 30 days, you're down in the high teens on all of these numbers. That's not good. But when you take out 30 days of not having bought contact lenses, frames, and optical lenses for cost of goods and so forth, you know, we're, this isn't, I don't want to paint a, a rosy picture at all, but it's, it's, it's less discouraging. It, it feels less very bottom of the barrel. So I appreciate you sharing those numbers with us. Let's go on to exams. Right, so if we, if we just take a look at what that means to our practice in terms of exams, uh, we're down 316 comprehensive full exams this year over last year during the period, the period being March 19th through April 20th, which um, in, with the new schedule, 14 to 15 slots a day, and that's all we have at every 30 minutes, and that is if every single slot is full and it's if every single person shows up, um, that would mean that from now until the end of the year, I would need 21 more days to, to make that up. So um, we currently don't see patients on Saturdays. Some, some practices may decide that adding Saturdays is a great way, or even Sundays afternoons or something is a great way. Um, that's really not practical with the type of um, environment that I have. So um, probably our strategy is going to be to perfect our model with 30 minutes. And then as time progresses through the late summer, fall, um, modify the schedule and, and try to catch this up. Great way to look at it. So I like analytics. I've always taught my staff um, that the value of a patient um, is critical. So revenue per patient, that is. We call it here the value of a patient. And I use it a lot to reduce um, no-shows or cancellations or emphasize to the staff how important it is to 
not lose a patient off the schedule. So for example, if your average uh, revenue per patient is, let's just pick a number, $350 times 10 patients that didn't come that week, it's that amount of money that's walking out the door. So I've always taught that. But now this has kind of, um, yeah, go, go ahead and go back one, Scott. I'm sorry. This has kind of brought it to a new level. So it, it's kind of like that light bulb moment that went off when I said, okay, I'm down 316 exams and I'm down this much money. Um, what I did was I went back and looked at the um, average revenue per exam and multiplied it by the number of exams that I was down and it was almost exact. So it was, I'm just pointing that out because it's also part of my recovery plan and my part of my financial planning to really now trust that revenue per patient model in terms of future planning. So again, data, data, data. And then finally, um, I think the next slide talks about uh, May last year. So May of last year, uh, we saw 287 patients total. At 14 uh, to 15 slots a day, there's 20 approximate working days in May because of Memorial Day. So I do have the capacity to see that many, but um, again, uh, I, not the capacity in May to jump ahead yet. So what we've done is just reset goals here. And essentially right now for May, my goal is, is to stay even with May of last year. And for that, I would do cheers. So <laughs> that's sort of where we're at with our planning. Uh, and I know that they're gonna go into a lot more financial planning um, Thursday. Yes, uh, so I'm going to spend a few minutes um, at holding at this point, and I'm going to try to do a rapid fire across a broad range of topics that have been brought by our attendees. And I think there's some great questions here. Um, this is, does your staff, have they, have they yet adjusted spectacles while they have, you know, they and the patient have a mask on and they have gloves on? And again, let's go rapid fire. How, how, yes. how quickly can you? The answer you know? is yes. We've been open the whole time. My optician has been here the whole time. That's part of why I've We've done this so that they can get used to wearing the gloves, the masks, the face shields. Remember, even the opticians, we talked about this last week, are wearing the face shields with the mask as they adjust glasses plus the gloves. So it takes, that's why I, I'm trying to emphasize time. All this takes time to get your staff up to, up to speed with this stuff. And with a patient having the mask on, making it. Oh, yeah. Uh, we talked about that you, as best as you can, schedule any sort of optical activities, including frame selects. Yes. Okay. Are, um, are you putting any contact lenses on a patient, like a first-time wearer? We have been practicing emergency care only, so we will be adopting um, the self-teaching mode using the iPad instructional and seeing if that works. I don't know if it's gonna work. So the answer is no, we have not done it because we've only been providing emergency care, not new contact lens wear stuff. Uh, checking on the health and wellness of your staff. Are you guys using a thermometer in office and checking each other's? Are you checking yes. the staff? Both. It's a, and it's a temporal uh, thermometer, yep. a forehead yep. thermometer. Yep. I will tell you, like personal protective equipment folks, as excited as we are to get ready, a lot of these things for regular consumer use on Amazon and elsewhere are simply on extended back order. Just FYI, uh, there, there, are, there are a difficulty getting some of these things. You talked a little last week about paper questionnaires and pens, briefly hit on the topic of intake. So intake, we are doing a COVID-19 intake questionnaire. We are asking patients to uh, fill that out with their own pen. If they don't have one, we have sanitized pens. We're, re we're collecting those in a tray and re-sanitizing them. But I, I, at this time, we're taking patient temps and um, COVID intake information on a the form. I think, I think that was distributed. Yep. The face shields that you have, I believe that resource was shared and that should be on the iThrive.net website. That's correct? Correct. You're changing gloves per patient, yes? Yes. 
please everybody take a look at medical standards for hand washing and medical standards for removing gloves without contamination. It's an absolutely critical service that you're providing to patients to deliver care with gloves on. The gloves are an immense source of contamination if not used right. And if you don't wash properly beforehand, you don't take them off properly. So there are plenty of YouTube videos to watch how to take off gloves in a manner in which the inside out of the first one takes off the second one and so forth. I'm um, going to try to hit a couple of these. Uh, the COVID-19 intake form, the webinar archives, all on ethrive.net, E-Y-E thrive.net. Um, okay. So, um, I'm going to check one more space. I hope anyone that's never run a webinar knows how challenging it is to, this is like driving and text messaging, which I don't do, but I'm trying to drive the car down the road and uh, take a look at things. Um, yes, a PDF from last week, Laura, your animation is being requested that people love that. Um, somebody asked, last May you were seeing patients 30 a day. How do you believe you'll actually be even with half that schedule this year? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to help you guys. I'm going to figure it out and we're going to do this. Absolutely we are. You know, we're not going to do it in May, probably starting back. Um, one thought that I had, you know, listening to these questions and, and, and it, the physical plant is really important to secure, but I can't emphasize how important it is to start working with your staff. It's going to surprise you. It's going to shock you. Um, it's not easy. I, it's not. I, I really had to work through a lot of things. And the, the number one takeaway, the more you do to ensure their safety, the easier it is. So you can't really do too much. You, you need to do it. Or, or you won't have people that are willing to return. The beauty of what you're sharing with us, Dr. Lipiad, is that you are pretending that there's a cookbook. There's a lot of webinar presentations out there being delivered by industry and others. I, I think there, there are many good efforts, but what you're doing here is being very open, very transparent, um, and are willing to say, I'm going to make the most of it and see what happens. But that's all you can do is make the most of it. And I think a lot of folks are looking for all the answers. And I hope these, this webinar series shows you that the key here is sharing information with one another, not looking at any one person as the expert. But Lori's been through nonstop patient care now for five weeks, and I think brings a very valid, valid perspective on things from scheduling to staff management. Um, in my way of coaching practices at the Sandbox, what I talk about are the various things you have to do. Your attitude in your leadership, taking care of your staff and its culture, looking at your physical plant, the tools you need to use, the equipment that you have, and the processes that you have in place, and finally the analytics that go around measuring all those things. And too often we've gotten caught up in a full book of patients and kids soccer practice and somebody graduating from college and getting out of the office early on a Thursday. And now it's about working probably a little harder and thinking a little bit more broadly than we have. There just isn't a template. I can't thank you enough, Dr. Lipiat, for being so open and, and forthright with us. Uh, with that, I'm going to make sure everyone understands that our next webinar is with Dr. Mick Kling, who's been on a bunch of different sessions before and during the pandemic around financial management in your practice. He's going to dig in deeper. I'm happy to be moderating that session as well. That will be at the same time, sponsored again by GPN Technologies on Thursday. That's April 23rd. We can't thank you enough. Dr. Lipiat, thank you for being here with us again. Oh, thank you, guys. Um, remember, it's an overused phrase, but um, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, even though it's an overused phrase, um, a marathon isn't easy. In fact, it's pretty awful sometimes. However, the process of learning, having patience, and pushing through dark times um, have made all of us ODs resilient, and uh, we, we can do this together. So thank you. That's a great, for a great statement. I appreciate that. For all of you who are attending, hey, listen, I ran a few events in my life, never a marathon. I don't get that. And I literally would have to think at, at big mile markers, you know what? You're just competing to complete. You're not competing to win. There isn't a way to win practice. If you've read Simon Sinek's Infinite Game, which is a great book, there's no way to win optometry. 
right? The way to win is to put one foot in front of the other on a plan, see how you execute on that plan, measure how you're executing, and then adjust. And I can't thank, again, for the third time, Lori, enough for being so transparent and willing to share her thoughts. I'm sure they motivated you to even have more questions. Please send them to us. We'll try to answer them here from GPN Technologies. In the meantime, I want to thank all of you for attending to the bare end of this. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Until we see you again, keep being great at everything you do.